So over the next few days, I'm going to share with you a restoration I'm doing on a W.E. Hill violin at the moment. It's from 1890. So the father of the owner personally travelled from Australia to London to buy it for her. Now as I'm working on it, I'll tell a little bit about the story, firstly of the maker, but then also the story of the violinist because it's a really interesting story. The instrument hadn't been played for over 50 years but had been looked after pretty well so it's not a major restoration. It had like some open spots, it had a minor crack and then the rest is basically just maintenance that hasn't been done for many years. Well, it's, uh, it's been, um, I glued this yesterday evening, so um, time to take the clamps off. Um, I like to, I actually really prefer letting the glue dry overnight. Uh, it just uh, gives it that extra time to really work. Now all the, there's like bits of glue, like I washed the glue off as much as I could while it was, um, while it was still wet, but there's just tiny bits usually left, so I'm just gonna wash those off and I have to soak them with cold water first. So I'm just gonna wash the glue off today and then um, I'll be putting a, um, I'll be putting a little uh, reinforcement cleat underneath this um, this little crack here. Um, so I'm going to take this one out. I'll just leave this little one here, just uh, even though it's glued, and so you can see the crack where it was, just down in here. Um, so it's just going to get a bit of. I'll reinforce it and then I'll also fill um, where the where the varnish has come off. I'll just fill that. And so I'm just gonna clean a tiny bit more. I have to do use a tiniest bit of filler. There's a couple of where where the crack is. It's just a couple of broken out bits of timber. They're minuscule, absolutely tiny, but I just want to fill that to make it look better. All right, let's get this reinforcement underneath here. It's quite tricky to do that through the F hole. So I'm going to fit a uh, fit a little reinforcement cleat on the, for underneath and then I have to slip the whole thing through the F hole so it's going to be super tricky. So now the tricky part is uh, getting that to <laughs> through the F hole somehow and then getting it to stick. So there's not a lot of room here, these are quite narrow F holes. I basically fix it to the clamp using a bit of blue tack. Ta -da. Now I much prefer working on cracks on, um, on instruments when I have the top plate off fully like um, like this top plate. Um, it's much easier. For a tiny f-hole crack like this it's cheaper and much much better just to do this from the outside. So now I've just got to wait for the glue to heat up, so I'll, um, yeah, I'll come back in a few minutes. Okay, so while I'm waiting for that, I might actually get started on the bridge. I know it's a bit early, but uh, sometimes it's nice to have a bridge finished um, for the end of the repair. Um, yeah, when I, when I set up the instrument, so. I'll get stuck into the bridge for this. 
Now this is a beautiful old instrument, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pick a I'm gonna get a bridge with really nice grain. There's kind of a weird disfiguration here, but that'll come off when I uh, when I plane it. So I want to drop the bridge down a little bit so it sits a bit lower. So that means I, uh, I'm going to take a little bit off the feet here for starters. Uh, I usually, I don't always bother with pencil marking these because it's, I can usually see it quite well. I just finished fitting the um, finishing the uh, fitting the feet, and I forgot to come back and show you how I mark the height. So I'm just going to redo it. I've already taken that off, so it's really important to get the string height right here. So uh, so what I do is I measure across the fingerboard to make sure. So I usually use five and a half millimeters for the G and three and a half millimeters for the E string and uh, mark that in usually and then I use my template to mark in the curvature and get that get that right and then uh, once we've got that which I kind of did a little bit earlier I just forgot to film we got distracted uh, and uh, I'll hang, take this out of the way and uh, I'll just cut the right, get this to the right shape. This curvature is really important. It's actually been worked out so that it's quite easy um, to move the bow across. I mean, you know, when you're playing on the E string, your, your hand is quite up here and on the G string, it's down here. It um, the curvature of the bridge makes it so it's not too high up or too low down but it's just right so you don't actually touch another string at the same time and that's really important uh, that the um, the curve has that and, and so it's been perfectly worked out I made this template in 1990 and I've been using it ever since and it's a template shape that my dad's been using since the 1950s. So, uh, you know, it goes back a long way. Um, and uh, I'm pretty sure that he got it off somewhere, maybe off the Mittenwald School or something like that. So it goes back a long way, this, this exact shape. It really works. Okay, so the next step's going to be thick, thinning out the bridge a little bit. Uh, which I do with the um, with the plane and after that I'm gonna start just carving the bridge but here again I'm gonna just cut forward and uh, I will come back in a little while this this will this takes a little bit long and might be a bit boring to watch okay so I've just tested that this fits through the F hole okay. Man, it's tight. <laughs> but it fits. So now I have to put glue on here. I've been heating up the glue for a while. And now I'm gonna put this in and I'm now I've got to be fairly quick about this because the glue it actually turns to jelly when it gets cold. It's pretty crazy. Just clamping it in. Okay, so it's evening now. The um, the glue here has dried, so I can take the clamp off, and then I'm gonna fill. I'm gonna get this blue tack off. Ah. Yes, it came off cleanly. That's awesome. That's going straight to the bin. Um, and then um, 
After this, I'm just going to fill that there's some little areas in here that just need a tiny, tiny bit of filler. And I'm going to make a filler out of my glue and, um, <coughs> and some dust, some special timber dust. It's super, super fine. It's the finest dust you can get. And uh, then I'll fill that and it'll need to dry a bit again. But I'll, I'll start polishing around some of the other areas just to get started on it. There's also a bit of varnish. Uh, like here, there's some areas where the varnish is worn right off. So I'll probably do a little bit of varnishing there. So I'm just going to get a little bit of... Dust. No! Dust! Everybody! No! Mix it in with glue so it's all reversible. It's such a, it's such a small bit of timber that I, uh, that I have to fill that I don't want to um, cut out any of the timbers to repair it. It's just super, super small. Fantastic. Once that's dry, I'm going to use a different type of uh, filler varnish to kind of fill the rest of the crack. Um, you want the crack to pretty much be invisible when I'm finished, so... So I'll have to put in some filler varnish and then I'm going to have to do a little bit of retouching in there. Now we've got some patches here that um, where the varnish is worn off. So I'm going to just add a little bit of varnish to those areas. Then I might do it. Just get started on some polishing in some areas, just a rough polish. Okay, you can see all these edges are worn away, worn right down to the timber. And this edge is partially worn away. I could, you know, if I was doing a full restoration, I would probably replace this edge. But the client um, asked for a little bit simpler restoration. So uh, I won't be... Uh, replacing the edge. I'll just protect it with some extra varnish. This little area is where I glued um, yesterday, so just putting a bit of extra varnish into the joints where I glued. Then I'm just putting a bit of varnish on uh, around the edges where it's chipped. Like a lot of oil varnishes have a combination of oil and resin. And depending on, like if there's more oil, the varnish gets soft. But if you put too much oil in, the varnish gets too soft and never dries. And there was a famous letter by Antonio Stradivarius when... Uh, where he wrote to a um, aristocrat that had ordered an instrument uh, saying, you know, apologizing for not getting the instrument done in time because the varnish hadn't dried yet. So it gave us a good clue about the type of van varnish that various used. Here the varnish is actually mixed with the dirt. So what must have happened is uh, that the, the instrument heated up and uh, either it was a hot day, I think the instrument spent a lot of time in Australia and then the instrument heated up and the varnish softened and then the perspiration and a little bit of dirt on the hands of the player would have mixed in together with the varnish. So another good thing to do when you're playing your violin or your instrument is always wash your hands before you play because any kind of dirt that's on there will uh, can get into the varnish. I love the evenings in my workshop because no one rings. So I'm just building it up a little bit of varnish um, around the edges. Uh, the varnish recipe I'm using is uh, from the early 1700s and uh, it has a nice combination between being you know sturdy to protect the instrument 
but also have a softness to it. Just let this dry a little bit up there and I am now just going to put a bit of filler varnish on here. Okay, I will let this dry overnight now and I'll get back to it tomorrow. So, that was day three of my minor restoration of the W.E. Hill violin. It's starting to take shape. Click subscribe and the little bell, and also, of course, like the video. And this way, you will find out when I upload the next video.